Alright, according to YouTube, I am live. Now we just have to make sure that uh, everything's working on this end, and there we go, alright. Good morning. It's good to see people here. Um, it's humid, but currently not too hot, but uh, I think it's going to rain pretty heavily in the afternoon. It is also what do we like to call um, Father's Day here in the United States. I don't know if that happens other places, but that's what it is here. So if you're a father, good on you. Um, okay, cool. All right, now it seems I'll be working. There was a bit of a lag there. Let me grab the chat window. Spectacular. All right. What else have we got? Good morning from Denver, Charleston, South Carolina, Tokyo, California, Germany, Australia. Greetings from Australia. It's one in the morning. Or sorry, it's new. It's midnight. But who needs sleep? That's that's a very good question. I appreciate that, uh, Amir. Um, Arkansas, Berlin, Greece. It's Father's Day in the UK. That's basically the same thing. At least it sounds like it is. Germany, Suffolk. Boiling France, Denmark, Calgary. Brant says, nice fetid blade drone. That picture actually that's on the title thing here, that was a picture of one of the GW ones that they showed off at, it was the first public showing of the actual painted models back in May when I was at that convention in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, that uh, distributor convention. Games Workshop had a booth there and they had this glass case that had all the models in it so I took a bunch of pictures of Nurgle stuff because that's what I like and so yeah that, that's it was on my phone so I think I, I, you know, I wanted to put something in there so I made sure uh, let me see here Norway, Canada, France Brooklyn, Southampton greetings from the surface of the sun aka Manchester, England hello Andy2d6 good to see you uh, I, I'm sorry to hear that it's quite warm over there uh, it was pretty warm over here earlier in the week, but it has gotten a little bit better, but now it's getting rainy, so, um, you know, but honestly, the grass needed it, so that's going to help. It's also Father's Day in South Africa, according to my sources, so that's good to hear. Uh, Sweden, Orlando, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Argentina, also Father's Day there. See, I don't know a lot about how those holidays work, but I'm glad to hear it's not just, not just American fathers who get Father's Day. All kinds of people get Father's Day, so that's good. Canton, Ohio. Um, Peter asks, am I the only one hearing an echo? Gosh, I hope so. Is anybody else hearing an echo? I would like it if that would not be the case, if there would be no echo, but we will see how it goes. Uh, when isn't it hot in Qatar? Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. Sacramento, California, 109 degrees. Antarctica, Brant says it's too hot to prime, too wet to prime. Yeah, I was going to do some priming yesterday, and then I ran out of time, and now today it's going to be way too humid, and I'm not going to do it. So, um, Got a bunch of other people saying no echo, so that's good. Um, I was having some... I did the, the Top Secret live show for the Uncle Adam's Irregulars yesterday, the Patreon uh, subscribers. Uh, I did that yesterday, and it was the first time I'd done a live show since the on the road live show at Tabletop Minions Expo two weeks ago and I just assumed that if I plugged everything back in everything would be fine but that was not the case so at the beginning part of that show the microphone was was coming through the webcam and not through my fancy you know USB microphone so that was kind of a bummer but yeah so okay um, some people say they do hear an echo well that's weird most people say they don't I'll have to listen to it later on and try to figure out what's going on. It, I don't know why it would try to pull from two mics at once. Let me, well, actually, let me turn this mic off. Um, well, hang on. Let me make sure that I'm not... Yeah, that's turned off too, so I don't know what would be causing that issue. Um, I'm going to turn off this mic just for a second and see what happens. All right, so I cleared my throat once turning off that mic, and I didn't see the little levels bounce. So I'm assuming it's not pulling from two. I don't know what else the problem might be, but like I said, I'll try to listen to it later and see what we get. 
Um, let's see here. This weekend was hot as the sun in London, UK. Yeah, it, it's. Um, I've been hearing that there's been a, a bit of a heat wave going on over there, uh, over the over the sea. So that's good. Father's Day here, and all four girls went out, leaving me and my son to play Eighth Edition again. So that's pretty good. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Um, let me see here. There is a bit of a hum in the background. There's always kind of a bit of a hum in the background since I'm in the dining room and currently and not in a fancy studio. Uh, I'm going to try to fix that soon, hopefully. Um, my plan is to eventually move all of this, hopefully before the beginning of July, downstairs into the basement, um, which will hopefully help a little bit with the hum as long as I make sure that I, you know, the furnace isn't on and the dehumidifier is not on and all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely planning on moving down there. I may for a while, while I'm still working on the basement, if I start, when I start working down uh, in the basement doing these live shows, I may have a green screen behind me, so I can put in all kinds of interesting background things. We'll see how that goes. Um, I'm trying to think. It says the 18th. Yeah, well, might not be next show, probably the show after that. We'll see how that goes. So yeah. The upside, I think, to it being warm, at least around where I live, is that most of us have air conditioning. Not everybody. Like, if you live in an area of, let's say, America, where it's always crazy hot, like Phoenix, Arizona, and stuff like that, everybody has air conditioning. That's just the... You, you wouldn't build a place without it. In Wisconsin, which is, you know, northern um, the United States, there's still plenty of places that don't necessarily have air conditioning, but most places do. Because our summers do get... They don't get crazy hot, but they do frequently get pretty crazy humid. So um, that can be kind of a problem, but exactly. D. Shruby asks, hey Adam, have you had a chance to send a thank you letter to Taco John's for bringing back steak tacos? I have not noticed actually, Dave, uh, that they have brought back the steak tacos because since they got rid of the steak, I haven't been to Taco John's much. Dave and I are friends here in you know town, and uh, so yeah, I haven't been back. I appreciate the uh, heads up that let me know that the that the steak tacos are back. So yeah, I just don't like. I don't really. I'm not interested in regular ground beef in my tacos. I like steak. Anyway, Adam, are you going to use the new Plague Marines from the starter for Shadow War, or are you going to wait until they are released in an individual box set so you can kit bash them? Uh, that's a good question, Brant. I'm probably going to use some of my Marines for Shadow War because my current Shadow War Warband, at least one of them, is, um, uh, what are they? Uh, well, they're the Chaos Space Marines, and so I was using my regular old school Plague Marines in there. I've got like three or four of them, and the rest of the guys are cultists, I think. Um, but I may swap those out once I get my Plague Marines, my new Plague, my fancy Plague Marines, Death Guard, whatever, uh, painted up, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I've also got an Imperial Guard list and that I'm working on, which I'll make a video about once I get them painted. Or during the process of painting them, I'm going to show you how I paint them, and then you will see. And then that's, that'll be the video. So let's see here. What else have we got? Uh, hey, Mr. Moderator Matt, Matthew Sears. Good to see you. Evidently, there was a crazy German. So I appreciate the, the help, and I hope you're doing well this morning, Mr. Matt. Uh, let's see here. What else have we got? Todd Harris says, that sounds really very cool with green screen. I do videography. It'll be a nice touch. If I can get it to work, it'll be a great touch. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'll have to do some practice on it. I do have a big honking green screen now, though. I bought one of those kind of fold-up pop-up ones. And it's like five foot by seven foot. Um, I used to work for a company, and we bought one of those. It was a you know production company. Um, multimedia stuff and we bought one of those probably eight nine years ago it was like a hundred and fifty dollars now you can get one of those pop-up five by seven blue screens for on and like amazon for i think i paid thirty dollars maybe 35 with free shipping so um it's kind of interesting to see how all that stuff has really changed in price you know um since back in the day but yeah let's see here what else have we got is anyone missing their fine weather because it's turned it's turned up in the UK? The sky is a weird blue color instead of gray, and leaves are all bright green instead of gray. Yeah, I've heard that problem as well. Um, you know, I mean, things were getting kind of brown here, but then after we had some pretty good rain last week, now it's kind of green, so that's good. 
Sean McDonald says, thank you for the TM dice. I hope I can make the expo next year. Um, absolutely. Yeah, no, it, I had the I had the dice, I had the pins at the expo. Um, they sold pretty well. I'm going to be adding those to my web store once I get my web store added, uh, figured out. I was talking a little bit yesterday in the, the Top Secret Patreon uh, feed uh, live show. I do a live show every month for Uncle Adam's Irregulars, who are the four dollar a month patreon people and i was talking about how my plan is next year i'm going to or next time when i get more dice made i'm going to get not just red white and red ones with white but also black ones with white so that i can sell them like mixed together where you could have the red and black because it's the logo it's up, you know, up there you know so it's kind of that kind of color combination is what i'm hoping to do next time um ordering the, the custom dice takes like five to six weeks so it's not like a quick thing but you know you basically you order it then you forget about it for a while and eventually you get this weird package and then it's filled with dice so that's fun andy 2d6 says i had to sell my giant green screen due to lack of space but i still have the small one yeah i've got an okay amount of space in the basement and i'll have a lot more once i clean the rest of it out um but that's the that's the current plan so Namir says, I'm trying to get into 40k right now since 8th edition seems the most easy for new players. It, it, yeah, I mean, they have, I don't want to say they've simplified things. They've streamlined things. They've taken some things out of the new 8th edition uh, that that were superfluous. Let's just say, it, you know, like that, because that's a fun word to say. Um, like, okay, for example, you used to have a ballistic skill for each figure. This guy has a ballistic skill of four. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is you would take that four, subtract it from seven, and that gives you three. And then you know to hit with the gun, you need to roll a three or higher on the die. So why don't we just say that he's got a three-up ballistic skill? Well, and that, that was the answer, frankly. And now they finally decided, no, that's, that's a good point. We'll just say he's got a three-up ballistic skill, or a four-up ballistic skill, or a two-up ballistic skill. And I think that kind of stuff has made, um, it's made some good sense. Dominic Foster says, I need to know where to find your web store. Um, it's not up yet. That's that's part of the, the, the trick. Carson asks, do you have dates yet for TMX 2018? I don't. Um, again, it will be probably in early um, June. My hope is to have it probably the first weekend in June. I have to touch base with the people at the university where the facility is. And I have to make sure... Because it's after college lets out, but before like the summer semester starts, there's a weekend in there where they they do this maintenance campus wide where they shut down the water or the steam or something, and then like the entire campus is a little squirrely while that's happening, and so they don't want to run events while that's happening. They call it steam shutdown weekend. Um, anyway. So my point is, is that I want to make sure this year she thought when I first set up the date that that might have been steam shutdown weekend. And then she double checked with maintenance and found out it was the weekend before or after. So we want to make sure it's not the same time. So she's got to check on that stuff. So as soon as I find out what the new dates are and the date is you know, clarified and made sure not to be steam shutdown weekend, whatever that is, um, then I'll post that stuff on the website. So, yeah. Adam, thoughts on... GW retconning race names so they can copyright them. I mean, it's their right, you know, it's their business. Um, I still call the Imperial Guard the Imperial Guard, mainly because I can barely ever remember. Like, if I'm just talking about something, blah, 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 Imperial Guard, if I'm talking about it and try to use Astra Militarum, it, like, stops me. I'm like, and then I was going to, you know, use my uh, Astra Milit, so I just don't bother. You know, it's, it's their choice. Tiger Scorpion says, did you get a haircut, Adam? Yes, yes I did, on Tuesday. It was a long time coming, frankly. Um, David Escobar says, oh, anyone else not pre-order an Imperium Codex 1 thinking you could walk in and buy one only to be told GW was holding them all hostage and only gave stores a little bit? Um, I don't know if it was GW holding them hostage. At my local store, he ran out of the Imperium 1 books. Which, I mean, it makes sense. Ever, like, a lot of people like to play Space Marines. So um, I don't know if he didn't order enough or if he ordered an equal amount of everything and then it just, everybody kept buying the Imperium 1. I'm not 100% sure how that worked out. I don't know. I haven't heard that GW, like, limited them, but they may have. Um, like I said, 
just recently, I think that it was uh, the problem was at least at my shop. I just think he ordered the same of every book, not realizing that they would probably order or people more people would buy the Space Marines one. So let's see here. What else have we got? Torch says, "I think playing with PowerPoints is more for narrative play." Um, that's potentially the case. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, I've actually got a game coming up on Thursday. It'll be my first game of uh, 8th edition playing with a friend, and we're going to play PowerPoints just because we are lazy, and it's our first. It's just basically like, you know, kicking the tires, seeing how things are going with 8th edition. So we're just, for ease of use, just going to grab a bunch of stuff and give them power, you know, power ratings or whatever, and then just play from there and see how it goes. Um, for those of you that don't know, the... The, the data sheets in 8th edition for each unit, they now have a power rating. So instead of having to go through and say, okay, well, each guy costs this many points, and this guy's gun costs this many points, and this guy's gun costs this, and coming up with all that, which can take a long time, you can just say, I want five guys, and they, 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 they cost this much power rating. And they don't take into consideration special weapons or the lack thereof. So if you completely heavily stack the guys that you build in your unit, you could probably make it so that you're actually kind of, I don't want to say cheating, but you're getting a little bit more than what your power rating is doing. On the other hand, if you don't put any special weapons or anything like that into your power into your list, then your power rating might be a little bit more than it ought to be. But um, according to their Twitch channel, Warhammer TV, when they were talking about 8th edition recently, said that that power rating number is kind of like trying to hit an average of, you know, average special weapons, average not too many special weapons, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of their deal right now. Um, I know that the guys from Mini Wargaming were cranking through a lot of their earlier um, bat reps just using the power ratings, and a bunch of people complained in their comments, which was kind of a bummer. So they did eventually switch over to... Um, to points, but the fact of the matter is, is that I mean, Dave even said, you know, when I sat down and tried to figure out this list for this particular bat rep, he's like, it took me half an hour to find all the, the points because the points are all in the back of the book and they're really kind of weirdly laid out. So he's like, you know, it took like a half an hour to come up with this entire list, but when I sat down to just try to figure out what the power points were, it took me 30 seconds. So, you know, again, it's probably aimed a little bit more towards narrative play or for people who are just wanting to quickly throw something down and go. Obviously, tournaments will use points because otherwise people will, you know, game the system, as it were. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, that's the difference between uh, power ratings, the new thing in 8th edition, versus just using the regular points. And like I said, you can still use both. Um, do you know when the ebooks of indexes will be available for Android? I don't, actually. Um, I think think that they're available for iOS. Uh, actually, to be fair, I haven't looked. I think I saw ebook stuff on... I saw m mentions of it on the website that, of all the indexes and things like that, but I didn't. It said, I think it said click for more information and I didn't click for more information. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work out. But it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. When using points, it takes time to build a list, find units, all that stuff, get them geared up. Yeah, exactly. That's that's kind of the trick right now. Especially, like I said, it's in the back of the book. One of the reasons seeing the points are actually on the data sheets, whereas all, I'm sorry, the power ratings on the data sheets, whereas all the points and stuff are in the back. Why I think they're doing it that way, and it makes sense to some degree, is it will allow them to tweak the points more easily. They can just make a PDF and say, here's all the new points. And then they don't have to, because if the points were in the data slates, data sheets, they would have to crank out all new data sheets and then they couldn't just share them freely because if you have the data sheets, then you know that, then you would have the data sheets and you wouldn't have to buy an index or whatever. So this way they can just go for a while at least now, they can just go, here's the new points and you go through and go, oh, that's how much these things cost now. Okay, cool. But that still the data sheet itself doesn't have to change and probably the power level most likely won't change either. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Adam, have you played Dreadfleet? I have never played Dreadfleet, no. There are probably three or four copies of it at my local game shop um, that uh, they're still trying to sell, so if anyone's looking for a copy, let me know. I can probably hook you up with a guy who can get you one. Uh, but otherwise, no, I've never played it. The models look amazing, honestly. They're really cool little like pirate ships. For those of you that don't know, Dreadfleet was a box set 
game that GW put out after they did third edition um, Space Hulk. So they put out Space Hulk back in like 2008, the brand new version with the much cooler dynamic looking guys and all that stuff and everything, the new super cool tiles. They did all that kind of stuff and they put that out and then that sold like crazy and then it was like $300 on eBay for people because they did a limited edition. So then they're like, cool, now we're gonna do another one of those types of games. And they're like, look, Dreadfleet. And everyone went, what? I don't know, because they'd never heard of it before. It was based off of fantasy, but it was ship combat and it just didn't sell nearly as well. I've heard it's a decent game, and the models, like I said, look amazing. But so yeah, I, I've I've never gotten a chance to play it though. So yeah. Any idea when we will get the real codex for everything? Um, I have heard that it will most likely be probably later this year. Potentially fall is when the first ones will drop. I can basically guarantee you they will probably not drop them all at once like they did with the indexes. Um, I'd be amazed if they did. Most likely they will start to trickle them out like a couple a month. And if it's anything following along the lines of the Age of Sigmar, which I feel it probably will be, kind of, because you can see there's a lot of parallels between the new 8th edition rules and Age of Sigmar, most likely what they will do, in Age of Sigmar you have um, the, the main, like, thick, soft cover books, which are basically just reprints of the stuff that you can download for free off the website, the War Scrolls. But then for the very specific factions, like the Auric Iron Jaws, not just all Orcs, but just the Iron Jaws, or just Death Rattle, or just, you know, uh, Clan Pestilence, or whatever, uh, for the Skaven, they have these hardcovers that are a lot thinner, and they have, again, the same War Scroll stuff, but they also have the special, like, Battalions, which I think will be either known as Detachments or Formations, probably Detachments in 40k. Um, they'll have those in there, which you won't be able to get anyplace else. They'll probably have special allegiance powers, special warlord traits, I don't know, stuff like that. And to be able to use those detachments, like right now, in the current 8th edition book, all you need to do to be able to get a detachment to work is they have to have the same faction keyword, which in the case of Imperium, let's say, means that in a single detachment, you could have Space Wolves, Grey Knights, uh, Inqui Inquisition, sisters and um, I don't know uh, Imperial Guard they could all be in the same detachment and you would and that would be fine because they all have the Imperium faction keyword in these new codexes if they're gonna do it like they do it over at Aegis Sigmar most likely these special detachments um, will be specific and say that the entire detachment needs to be blood angels only or something like that and then you will get some special bonus besides just extra command points, you'll probably get other stuff as well. And that's what will probably be in the new codexes coming out. But I don't think the codexes are going to be like the codexes like we used to have. There will be fluff in the front and that kind of jazz, because that's what they're doing with Age of Sigmar as well, but then the information in them. So I think that, if anything, I would be surprised if they didn't start making a lot more codexes in the, than they used to. Like, you'll have, like, a Blood Angels codex and a Space Wolf codex, but I don't know that you'll just have a Chaos Codex. It'll probably be, there'll be a Nurgle one, there'll be a Corn one, there'll be a, you know, and they'll have all these separate ones for all the different sub-factions, too. Um, I could see a bunch of different sub-faction ones for Imperial Guard. You know, there could be one book that's just Steel Legion, or, or whatever, you know, I mean, it's hard to say. Um, but yeah, we'll see how that kind of goes. <clears throat> Michael Strange says, I just tore off the cellophane wrapper on the starter box. Oh, that awesome smell of new plastic and printing inks. It's probably not super healthy, you know, but if you just sniff it for a while, it's probably okay. Probably. Like, if you just, like, if that's, if you worked at the printing place all the time, it's probably not necessarily great for you long term. I don't know. Uh, maybe they're very, you know, maybe they're soy inks and everything's cool that way, but I don't, I don't know. Daniel says, greetings from Taiwan. Nice haircut, Uncle Adam. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was, like I said, it was getting pretty shaggy. So, yeah. Um, VJ Morph says, I'm hoping the new fluff destroys the entire Tau race. They suck. Well, you know, some people like them. I, I, they were my first army. Um, you know, if you, if, especially, I think, if you like anime, they are totally right up your street because they're cool. You know, they're all those big honking robots and stuff. So that's, that's cool. But um, they're very shooty. That's true. 
Uh, Ted Morey says, Hi, I was wondering if you or anyone else knew the height of the new Primaris Space Marines, 35, 42. I don't know the exact height. I can tell you that in the pictures that I've seen, because I've not built one yet from the set that I have and, and then set it next to a regular Space Marine, but in the pictures I've seen, I actually just saw a really good picture this morning on the Tabletop Minions Paint Showcase Club on Facebook. Someone took like one of their old Marines and put it next to one of the new ones that they had built, and the new ones are probably an entire head taller. Now, from what I have heard, the heads are the same size as the regular Space Marine heads, and so are the shoulder pads, so they can be swapped back and forth. But the bodies and everything else, they're a lot lankier. Let's just say that. So, so yeah. Joshua Haddon says, finally, a Night Lord Codex, hopefully. Yeah, very potentially. Uh, if, Like I said, if they follow that same model, um, and they were kind of doing that towards the end of 7th edition. They were putting out, like, you know, Traitor's Hate and all these other little sort of weird sort of sub-codexes. I have a suspicion that they will probably do a lot more of that, possibly with 8th. And again, the trick is, and this is the same thing with Age of Sigmar, you don't have to use, at least, it, basically, because they have the indexes now, I have a suspicion you may not need to use a codex for your army if you don't have, if you don't want to. Like, I have never bought one of the hardcover codex, or I don't know what they call them, uh, battle tomes maybe? I've never bought one of those yet for Age of Sigmar. I just use the normal, um, you know, download the PDF uh, War Scrolls and stuff like that because I don't generally run battalions. I just generally run my own stuff. So I don't have any, any of those types of things going on, which is fine. But I've got a friend who plays straight Sylvaneth, so of course he bought the Battle Tome. Um, once I eventually do actually get my Stormcast army together, uh, which is my third army for Age of Sigmar, I will probably buy this Stormcast Battle Tome just to have the special powers and stuff like that. But I don't know that it will be necessary. Now, I don't also know how long they'll keep the indexes up and, and available in the stores. If this is just a stopgap, okay, maybe. But we'll see. Um, I mean, honestly, who knows? They may they may even produce, because they're talking about how they're going to be producing an app eventually. That app might be um, a subscription model that allows you to have a built-in army builder, but maybe also gives you access to all of the uh, data sheets. Not necessarily the all the special detachments that are designed for your army, but it may at least give you access to all the data sheets. It's hard to say. I don't know. Um, It'll be interesting to see what they do with the new 40K app once it does launch. Um, yeah. What else have we got over here? Black Templar Codex needs to happen. I want Sword Brother and not Vanguards. I, I think there's a... Uh, I was looking through the Imperium 1 book, and I swear there was some there was some Black, uh, Black Templar stuff. There were Crusader squads, I think, and I, I think that you can have a sword brother in or sword brethren into a Crusader squad, but I don't know you can have an entire squad of sword brethren, at least not currently. So, um, Ralph has a good point. Ralph Hummel says the codexes might include updated data slates, which will supersede the ones in the index books. That's also a potential. That's very very possible. I have a suspicion they don't want to tweak the the data sheets too much, though which is one of the reasons why they didn't put the points on the data sheets so that they can just change the points on another you know, in another on another page on another table potentially like I said in a PDF that you might download kind of like a frequently asked questions and it will just have a listing of all the new points but being able to download that points thing won't help you unless you have the index to figure out you know all the stuff you need to figure out so yeah we'll see how that goes uh I just call my honor guard sword brethren. That's probably a pretty good idea. I can see that. Anthony asks, Hey, Uncle Adam, does Malifaux terrain work 28 millimeter terrain in, in terms of scale, or does it look way out of proportion? Love making terrain. Um, Malifaux terrain is... I mean, Malifaux is basically a 28 millimeter game. They're, maybe they creep sometimes a little bit more towards... I don't want to say they're heroic scale, because they don't have the super thick you know, wrists and, 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 and ankles and, and all that stuff. Um, they're a little bit more proper scale that way, but uh, the models themselves at, at worst are maybe 32 millimeter scale, so they're like maybe just a touch taller. If you put like a normal Malifaux guy next to say like an Imperial Guardsman or a Space Marine, they might be a touch taller, but the terrain that you would use in that, it should pretty much work for any other type of 28 millimeter type game. 
Um, when you get down to really close, you know, when you're talking the difference between 28 millimeter and 32 millimeter, they're really close enough that generally that stuff works pretty well together, I, I find. Let's see. 12 Neef, hey, how you doing? I hope they do a codex for it. Orcs seems like there's something missing from it. They hinted at clans, but there are no benefits for them other than certain characters for certain clans, but that's it. Yeah, and that's the trick. That's the way they did it in, in Age of Sigmar. So, like, there are there are these four big, thick, soft cover, relatively inexpensive books. They're basically like indexes. They call them Grand Alliance something or other. So there's, like, a, a Death one, a Chaos one, a Order one, and a Destruction one? Yeah. So, like, if you wanted to go with, with Iron Jaws, you could buy that book, but mostly the most of the stuff that's in that book is the stuff that you can just download for free because the War Scrolls for Age of Sigmar are free. But if you want the special Iron Jaws-specific stuff, then you buy the Iron Jaws little kind of thinner hardcover, which is that, that main battle tome for that, and then it has all the stuff in there, plus has fluff, plus has, I think, maybe some hobby stuff in there as well, and then also has um, uh, battalions, which are kind of formations for Age of Sigmar, um, and then it also has some, I think, some allegiance stuff, so special special powers that you can get as long as all the guys in your army are, you know, the specific, um, whatever, sub-faction, like Iron Jaws in that situation. The thing that's going to be interesting, too, to see, and I didn't play much in the way of seventh so i never really understood how formations worked but the way that i understood it is that in seventh edition 40k as long as you had the stuff that needed to be in the formation you just got the special formation rules that's not the way it works in age of sigmar if you decide you want to run a battalion and you follow all the rules for the battalion say you need two of these guys and one of these guys and whatever that's great you get the special ability but you still have to pay the points for the battalion. So it's not just free bonuses because you purchased certain models. It's like, hey, if you want this bonus, you have to buy these models, plus you also have to pay the points in the in the list to be able to use that special power. So that may be a thing going forward with the specific detachments that are going to be in these codexes down the road. I don't know this for sure, but that could be the case. I could see that making sense. If you extrapolate from Age of Sigmar how it works, you know, like you're not going to get free bonus powers, let's say, whatever they might be, just because you have these models. The way they did it in Age of Sigmar was that those detachments cost points. So if you want to use them, you can, and that's cool, and you get the special ability that you couldn't have without having these particular models, but you got to pay the points to be able to use that particular power. So I think that's not a bad idea. Um, and I have a suspicion that's what they may, what they may do with the normal detach, or with the specific detachments. The normal detachments that come in the 8th edition book, they don't cost any points. You just like, they're basically like the old force organization charts where they just say, okay, well you got to have this, this, and this, and then this is, you know, a legal battle forged detachment. So, yeah. We will see how that works out. Janice says, so I always wanted to get into 40k, seems like a good time, but how the hell do you pick a group? I can't decide Tau, Orcs, Tyranids, Necrons, they're all so cool. Um, if you're not, if you're super in, interested in being competitive, like you want to get heavy into tournaments, I've got no answers for you, especially now that they've completely changed everything with 8th edition. If you just want to have a really good time and, and build guys that you like and paint them and all that kind of stuff, then just find some units in whichever army that you really like the most just look at them and just go so i think this like these you know these like these orcs are awesome because i can do all this crazy stuff and they'll be fast to paint and i really enjoy them and they're funny or whatever or i really like tau because i'm in the anime or i really like you know whatever you're into um necrons i really like you know crazy undead robots um it you know it, it all depends but at this point right now especially if you're just playing because you really want to play and just have fun Pick the army you like best, honestly. Just pick like what they look like. You know, If you're thinking to yourself, I don't have tons of time, so I want to find the army that's easiest to paint, then maybe Necrons, because you could just kind of spray paint them silver and then hit them with some wash and then you know, touch up some details and you're good. Or maybe you can do the same type of thing with Tau. Or maybe you've got an idea for a paint scheme for your orcs. Orcs can be very dirty, so you can paint them kind of sloppy and it's okay. Whereas like Eldar, there's no such thing as a dirty Eldar generally. I might call them dirty from time to time, like a dirty Eldar, but they're actually, you know, 
fastidious. They don't, um, I think I said yesterday in the other chat that they probably, if you were in a snow battle, they would probably walk on top of the snow like uh, Legolas and Lord of the Rings. So, um, yeah, I couldn't ever paint uh, Eldar because they would be way too clean. I just, like, Sam does amazing Eldar. He do, he paints a bunch of Eldar for uh, our friend Kevin, and they're amazing. I've posted some pictures, actually, of some of them before on social media. Most recent one was probably... I want to say it was a Wraith Knight, the big, really super tall guy, and uh, just amazing paint job. So, you know, long story short, pick what you like. Pick what you think you're going to have the most fun with. Pick which limitations you think you might have. Maybe it's like, I, because I'll tell you right now, Fire Warriors for Tau, though they're real quick and easy to paint, um, each one of those little dudes is like 12 or 13 or 14 pieces. They can take a surprisingly long time to build. So, um that may be a thing, you know, that you may want to take into consideration as well. Ask people at your local shop what they think about that those things as well. That'll help. Or as Anton says, just pick all of them. Don't 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 pick all of them. That's probably not the best idea for a starter. Um, let's see here. Do you think that 40k should have point values to make custom characters for your armies? Like a like a like a character builder? I mean, you can kind of do that now, sort of. Like, I was looking at Chaos. I can make a Chaos Lord, and then I can make a Chaos Lord in Terminator armor or a Chaos Lord on a bike, and then you can modify their weapons and do all kinds of other stuff. Beyond that, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that they've ever really played with that kind of stuff where you can tweak. That'd be interesting. I think that you may find, if they des they may find, if they produced some sort of, whether it was an app or an instruction sheet or whatever, for you to be able to build, completely custom build your characters, we all may find out that, we may find how the sausage is made. Let me just put it that way. And we may find out that there's not a mathematical reason why some of these guys have the points that they do. Um, there was a game I used to play quite a bit called Silent Death. It was a spaceship combat game. And after they'd been getting more and more popular, this is back in the 90s, they got to a point where they, they made a piece of software that you could buy from them and then put on your PC, uh, and they sent you a floppy disk, <laughs> uh, and it allowed you to build your own ships. It was a ship construction thing. And the thing that was funny about it was that if you decided to build your own ship, that was great, but if you decided to build exact copies of the ship that was in the book, of any of the ships that were in there, the points would never line up. So that's when all of a sudden people discovered, you know, when you guys built this game initially, you didn't follow your own equations on how to build ships, so... You know, that's, and I think that there's probably, you know, because it's very difficult, I think, I've done a little tiny bit of game design. It is really difficult to mathematically equate, well, um, you know, twin linking does this and equals this many points, or this does this and equals that many points. You can come up with equations for some things, but some stuff you just have to guess. So if they were to say, okay, cool, we'll give you a, cre a creature creator, you know, or a, a character creator um, app. You could then go through and say, okay, I'm going to completely make Karn the Betrayer exactly as he is in the stats, and then you look at the points, and you look at his points, and go, they don't match up. And there's probably going to be a lot of that. So that's why I don't particularly think that they'll probably make any kind of character creator app. Um, I generally just like to, if I'm going to make a cre uh, you know, make a special character, I just follow one of the other characters and then just you know, kid him out with probably too much war gear, and then just put all the rest of my effort and time into painting them fancy and adding special you know modeling. I've got a Nurgle bike lord that I want to paint. He's all sculpted and ready to go, although I think I need to tweak one of his weapons now. He's got a power fist in one hand, and he's got, I think, a power axe in the other hand. I don't know why I mold, made him that way, but this is this is from 6th edition. So I think I'm going to get rid of the power axe, and, power axe and give him a flamer, or maybe a combi flamer. And... Um, yeah, so I'm going to do that and then paint him up. But he is totally, like, he's based off of normal body stuff for Chaos Bikers. But then I threw green stuff all over him and made him all nurgly and stuff. And when I get him painted, I'll show you guys pictures. It'll be cool. But I think that's the case, is that if you want to make your own special characters, you just kind of put a little bit more story into them and maybe kit them out with a whole bunch of crazy war gear and then go from there. I don't know that there's going to be a way for them to to kind of tweak it and give it give you the option to be able to build your own characters. I think that that would probably be rife for, you know, power gaming as well. That could be problematic. 
Ah, the floppy disk. I remember the dark age of technology, yes. Uh, I think it was a 3x5, or 3x5, 3, 3.5 inch floppy, not a 5 and a quarter. Because uh, it was the n mid to late 90s, I think. Yeah, that's when they when they had that, that thing. Joshua Haddon says, Flamers on Nurgle Bikes, yo. Yeah, I think that that's what I'm going to probably do for one of my... Like, I have a couple of different HQ units right now, but I think I'm going to definitely... Because I've already got them built. I was just reading something recently. I'm like, you know, a Nurgle biker with with a flamer would be probably pretty cool. And then I was like, didn't I make a Nurgle biker? And then I went down to the basement and I found him. He's just not painted. So, uh, I mean, he's even primed. You know, he's just not painted. Maybe I'll post a picture of him... Maybe I'll post a picture of him tonight before... Yeah. I'll post a picture of him. I'll put him on Facebook so you guys can see him. And then I'll try to decide what I'm gonna, what color I'm going to paint him. Because he's Nurgle, so he's, I'm assuming greenish. But we'll see. I don't know. Maybe I can make him uh, gross in a completely different way. I definitely want to put a lot of varnish on him to make him shiny, though, so he looks like specifically kind of wet. That's always disconcerting. <clears throat> VJ Morph asks, Adam, do you build all your forces WYSIWYG? I generally do, which is why sometimes I magnetize stuff. Um, back when I was, like, again, I, I I played maybe two games in seventh, so I haven't really been on this horse in quite some time. But, um, yeah, when I was playing fifth and sixth, I did always try to keep my guys WYSIWYG because I'm, let's be perfectly honest, I'm far more of a modeler and a painter than I am an actual player. Like, I like to play. I'm not competitive about it. Um, so, I mean, a lot of competitive people are always not... A lot of competitive people don't do WYSIWYG because they constantly want to change what kind of stuff they've got. They're like, okay, well, now this time I'm going to use this instead of this, so this guy's this, uh, and this guy's that, and whatever. I always want to try to keep my guys a little bit more visually appealing, and that's why I keep them WYSIWYG, to the detriment, probably, of the actual, uh, you know, uh, ability to play with them. But again, I'm not trying to win tournaments, so I don't kind of care. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm generally a lot more WYSIWYG. And like I said, magnets can be super helpful in those situations. Like that that Nurgle biker that I was talking about, I'm pretty sure both of his arms are magnetized. I don't know why I did that. I have a suspicion because there's like frequently if I'm going to magnetize arms on somebody, I've already got another option to swap. You know, like I will build it so that I could so this arm could be maybe a, a bolter or maybe a plasma gun or whatever. And then I make both versions before I even prime and stuff like that. But this guy, he's a biker, and he's got a power fist in one hand, and that arm is, is magnetized. And then he's got, like I said, a power axe in the other, and that one's magnetized. So I could just throw a whole different arm on there if I thought that the axe was useful. But I started looking at it, and I'm like, you know, I could just cut the... I could just cut the, the axe, the whole hand off at the wrist, and then just glue a different, um, a different gun on there and call it a day. Actually, I may throw a combi flamer on there because I think I have a combi flamer. I think I have a 30k combi flamer. I bought a um, the tactical marines that come in the Betrayal at Kalth, the Horus Heresy board game. There are tactical marines in there, and hmm, I'm pretty sure I have a I have a I bought a, a set of them on eBay. Just the tactical marines It's like 25 bucks, and I'm pretty sure they're in the basement. And I swear I saw that there's a combi flamer in there. I would just need to sort of chaos slash nurgle it up a little bit because it's very clean. All the um, 30k marines, it's astounding how they don't have skulls on them at all because the emperor's not been technically killed yet. So that doesn't, like the skull to space marines is basically like the idea of it is that that's like, you know, the emperor, that's his symbol because he's nearly dead or whatever. At least it seems to be the case. Just look at any normal 40k model. That's a space marine. He's covered in skulls. Skull on the backpack. Skull on the front. Skull on a skull on a skull. Um, but when you look at the 30k models, they don't have any skulls on them at all, which is interesting. So um, anyway, a little bit of a tangent there. Sorry. Um, so I think I'm going to put uh, probably a combi flamer on there, and then if I decide later on to switch it out and do something completely different, again, because that arm is magnetized, like both of them are, I'll just be able to swap the arms, because I do like to keep stuff WYSIWYG. Stuart Perry says, mark the polarity, which in most situations wouldn't make a lot of sense, but since we're talking about magnets, yes, that is exactly the case. For those of you who've never done any magnetization before, uh, you do, um, you, <laughs> If you put the magnets together wrong, one of them will shoot off and go into space. Not really space, but probably the another part of your basement that you don't want them to go into. So, um, yeah, you have to make sure when you're 
putting the magnet into the arm that you're going to eventually attach to the shoulder, make sure that the, they are attracting each other and not repelling each other. A lot of times people will take a Sharpie and mark. Like you'll put, basically you'll put the two magnets together and then you'll, so if these are the two magnets, you mark on the outside of this one and on the outside of that one. And then when you're putting them together into the models, one goes in the shoulder, one goes in the, ar in the, in the arm, you make sure to not see the Sharpie. Make sure the Sharpie goes into the body and into the arm, and then that way you know the polarity is right. That's just a quick tip, but it helps a lot. Emir asks, Adam, what is your opinion on the Skatari? A friend of mine wants to get into 40K with them. I think they're super cool looking. I don't know anything about how they play. They seem to be kind of fancy, and they're a relatively new faction, at least as far as 40K is concerned. I mean, they've been around forever, but there haven't been models and books for them and stuff like that since... I want to say they came out in 6th or 7th. I don't remember which one, but they came out, you know, not that long ago. Um, I think they're great-looking models, and um, if you like that kind of thing, you want to, you know, model that kind of stuff, and you like, and he likes painting it, you know, that's cool. Uh, like I said, I don't know anything really about them rules wise like if they're real fancy or stuff i know they have a lot of different rules they're very different they're not just like another type of space marine they're a very different a faction to play um i don't know if they're great for beginners others here in the chat may have some answers on that but um uh i, I think they're cool i've i've almost pulled the trigger on them a couple of times actually i did buy some skatari um there's a type of robot that you can there's a box set that's got two robots and then like a skatari dude in it and the robots are big and kind of rounded. They start with a C, and I can't think of the name of them. And um, they don't look like anything else that Games Workshop has ever made before. When I first saw them in the store, I was like, "That's a ro if you paint that olive drab and put a star on his chest, that's a robot from Fallout. He doesn't. They do not look like anything else 40K because they're very rounded and smooth. And they're not, yeah, they're just really interesting. So I bought them because I'm like... I'm going to paint them olive drab, put a star on them, and make them look like a Fallout robot, and then use them in something post-apocalyptic, and that'll be awesome. Um, but I haven't done it yet, but I've got the box in the basement. That's the only Skatari I ever bought, so... Uh, no, it's not Cataphracty. Castellans. There we go. Magnus the Red got it. It's just ca the Castellan robots. And, um, yeah, you get two of those guys, plus a regular kind of Admech Skatari-looking dude in the box... And, um, yeah, you paint those guys olive drab, kind of olive green, and you throw, like, a star or, you know, something like that, like a white, you know, like a, like a military vehicle, and you kind of, you know, kind of screw it up, make it look like it's the paint scratched up a bit, stuff like that, make them rusty looking, totally, totally fall out at that point. So, yeah, those guys are cool. <clears throat> um... Charles Knight says, Rob, it's not getting the magnet the right way around. I'm just hopeless at positioning them correctly, like the hole to sit the magnet in. Um, the trick is, is to, I've found is just to, the way that I do it is I find a drill bit that's the size of the little tiny magnets that I use, and then I drill the holes in there. And it takes a lot of dry fitting, takes a lot of messing around with that. But um, it, it's, it's noodly, and I wouldn't do it to an entire, like I would never do it to most of my normal troops. It's usually just like HQ units and um, and stuff like that. I only predominantly will do it to models that are, like I said, you know, a sergeant, maybe, if I want to get fancy, um, but definitely like a captain or a, a lord or something like that when, when I want to swap their weapons from things like that. I don't generally get too fancy. I've got a good friend who plays Blood Angels, and he has magnetized those guys six ways to Sunday. It's crazy. Like, he can put regular backpacks on him or jump packs. He can switch out this weapon or that weapon. He can do all this stuff, and it's crazy, and he's super good at it. I don't have that kind of patience, um, but, yeah, he's, uh, you know, magnets can be very, very cool. You have to know what you're doing with them. They technically, I guess, can be a little dangerous. Those little tiny neo... neo whatever, there's a word there somewhere. The little rare earth magnets, because they're so powerful, they can sometimes shatter... I don't know why, but they can. And so that can be problematic and go in your eye, I guess, or something like that. Um, but yeah, you have to be a little careful with them. Like the much bigger ones, if you start, if you get into a rare earth magnet that's much bigger, if you get your finger in between there, it will pinch super crazy hard and you could like really damage yourself. But I mean, you know, when I'm talking big, I'm talking like the size of like a 50 cent piece in America. But the ones that we use are tiny in comparison. And so it's almost impossible for you to pinch yourself with one of those, but don't try. Let's just say that. <clears throat> 
Uh, what else have we got here? Bubba Gump, have you seen the new Fallout War game that's being made? I, I've seen uh, images of the uh, models. Not all the models, but some of the models. The ones they've showed off, at least. And I uh, I don't know anything about the rules. Um, I don't know that I would go down that road. I like Fallout just fine, but I've... Uh, I don't know. I, I've just gotten to the point where I'm like, I get it, it was sort of Neo-50s. Okay. You know what I mean? Like... I never did understand, and I don't know that I've ever seen a good explanation about why it was 2077, but everybody acted like it was the 50s, like everybody, you know what I mean? Like it was this super 50s vibe in everything, but yet it was 2077 when it happened. Um, I'm assuming it's like some sort of alternate history, something did, you know, caused that for a reason, and it's fine, but like I played three, Fallout, I played Fallout 1, did not finish it, but I played it for quite a long time. I played a little bit of Fallout 2, not too much. Fallout 3, I played the heck out of, uh, and, Paul, and also Fallout New Vegas. And then Fallout 4, I played for a while, and then eventually, well, I was, I, I kind of fell off the wagon on video games, really, and just started, you know, I was really pushing hard on building a lot of stuff in the basement and stuff, so I haven't really played much in the video games for quite some time. That all being said, I don't know that I would get into that game. Um, the models do look super cool, though. So some of them, you know, maybe I could repurpose a couple of those models for some other kind of, uh, you know, for like Wreckage or something like if I wanted to. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think my my currently my post-apocalyptic um, roster is, is uh, for games at least is full. So definitely. Heavy Metal Bear says a live chat just for my birthday. Thanks, Tabletop Minions. Well, you're welcome. Uh, and happy birthday. Do, 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 do. Rob Lyon says, don't let your pets or children eat them. I'm assuming you're talking about magnets. Yes, don't do that. That's not a good idea. What else have we got here? Um, Fallout had just gone through a really big 50s retro kick when the bombs dropped. Yeah, it, but it, but like why? You know what I mean? Like it didn't, it's, was it just style? Because the thing is, is that like everybody had gone 50s. You know what I mean? Like there are fads that happen out here in the world from time to time, obviously, but not everybody jumps on board. You know what I mean? Like, I don't own a fidget spinner. You know what I mean? Not everybody would have... So if it was just like, oh, there's this new fad where everybody thinks it's the 50s and acts like it's the 50s and all the cars look like they're the 50s. And, but everybody was doing that. There wasn't anybody who kind of didn't have that going on back then, it seemed. Um, obviously now, you know, 200 years after the bombs dropped and stuff like that, it uh, is no longer the problem. I mean, now people are kind of just acting however they act. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Fallout 4 was really interesting because in the beginning of Fallout 4, you were actually back in 2077 when the bombs dropped. Um, and, yeah, and everything was super, super 50s and everybody acted that way and it was just really strange. Like, there was nobody who was, like, still, like, a, an 80s punk because that's what they were into, you know. They just rediscovered it, you know, in 2050 or whatever and decided, you know, I mean, it was just kind of odd that the story, like, everybody did that. And, I mean, initially, early on, it was kind of like a fun hook, but after a while, I just would start to play and be like, I don't understand, especially in 4th, because you got to see it. In all the previous games, all that 50s stuff was 200 years ago. In the beginning of Fallout 4, you were actually a character in 2077 who then went into, like, cryosleep in their... Um, vault and then woke up 200 years later so everybody that you run into is from now or you know is in, in, from the present and you're technically from 200 years in the past because you've been in cryosleep so that's one of the big differences between that game and all the other previous ones to some degree at least i found so yeah it was just interesting i maybe that's why i'm not super interested but also it's because i've got other post-apocalyptic games to play like i said uh, let's see here. Did anyone buy the 40k limited edition? Does it come with the indexes? Jeez, I hope so. For $420 American, it better come with the indexes. They ought to, uh, Kevin Roundtree, maybe I ought to bring it to your house. I mean, that's, when I heard that they, the, when that, that box was $420 for the, the uh, and that doesn't come with the models, I don't think. That's not like, yeah, that's just like, ugh. I looked at it and I was like, nope, no thank you. Frankie Lee Bailey says, 1950s theme, I, re I re rebuttal this with Cuba. Well, sure, but that was different because Cuba had to kind of do that because they were being, we were basically, everybody, a lot of people were just like, yeah, it was a different thing altogether. This was America just deciding to go back on purpose. 
Cuba would have preferred probably not to have acted like it was the 50s over there. And obviously, like I said, there was also people, you know, there were people over there that were trying to figure out, you know, like doing stuff with Wi-Fi and things like that. I was just, I read an article recently about all the interesting kind of uh, necessity is the motherhood of, of invention kind of things that they did in Cuba to, you know, because they had to. Like they, they couldn't get things. They could, the reason that those cars from the 50s are still driving around the streets is because they didn't have any other choice. They got to keep fixing them, you know, that kind of stuff. Whereas I don't, oops, I don't think that's the case with, um, with the Fallout universe, but... What else have we got here? Seven hundred dollars for that um, special edition in Australia. For that price, it's got to make me breakfast. Uh, I don't think it will. I'm not sure it's got that uh, kind of technology. Fallout Four DLCs were really bad, and I didn't like them. But New Vegas was really fun. I think the part of the games is reading the terminals and the speech, and I love that part. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people really enjoy the fluff in those kind of things. Um, you know, if games like Skyrim and things like that had, yeah, well, all the Elder Scrolls games have had tons and tons and tons of fluff. And so that's really interesting. In tabletop gaming, you know, in the tabletop wargaming that we do, there are people who are very interested in the fluff, and then there are people who just don't care. And neither of them are wrong. You know, I talk to people from time to time who are like, yeah, I don't play or collect, but I sure do love to read all the Black Library books about, you know, 40K or whatever. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Um, you're kind of immersed in that world, and that's cool. But um, there are also, I talk to people all the time who like want to play because they like to play, they like to model, but they don't care about the story or the backline. That's also cool. And that's one of the things that's neat about this hobby, in my opinion, is that you can go at it from all these different directions. You could just be a collector and never play at all. You could just like to build the models, paint them, put them in a case, and then go on to the next models, and that's fine, you know? Um, so, yeah, definitely. Oh, what else have we got here? Do you think Games Workshop will re-release Metal Imperial Guard miniatures in updated plastic form? And if so, what regiment would you like to see first? Well, that's a good question. I mentioned Steel Legion before. Um, and I know that Steel Legion you can, I think, only get in metal right now. Maybe fine cast, but probably only metal. And there's the Vestroians, and there's the Praetorians, I think. There's a bunch of different ones. It'd be interesting to see if they did that. I don't know if they will or not, though. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if they'll decide... Yeah, we're going to... I mean, they'd have to... The thing is, is that every time that they make new models, it's a big thing. They can't make new models for everything in their entire line, sadly. Um, eventually, they probably will, but they can't crank out a ton of stuff all at once just because of how expensive and difficult it is to make the injection molding molds, the, the steel molds that you do all that stuff with. So, yeah. Um, definitely. I would love to see Games Workshop add some Guards Women for Imperial Guard as upgrades as other companies are ahead of time or ahead of them when it comes to having female models. Uh, you and me both, Mecha82, I agree. Uh, there is a company called Victoria Miniatures, and they make uh, some some women models that are not exactly Imperial Guard, but they're kind of close. So if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and if you want to, I've thought about it, if I was to ever make an Imperial Guard, um, like, I eventually will probably make a Shadow War Imperial Guard, probably a third Imperial Guard warband that might be maybe mostly women. Um, I don't know if I'll make one all women, maybe. But, um, yeah, I think that'd be kind of cool. They, and the Victoria model makes, models make a, makes a lot of different uh, women characters, which are really cool. So, um, yeah, you should take a look at them. It's, they're mostly metal. But they're uh, they're they're cool. They're, she makes cool stuff, and so if you're looking for female guardsmen, that's guardswomen. <laughs> uh, that would be one of the places to start, at least right now. Hopefully, again, like you said, uh, hopefully they'll start doing it eventually. With um, yeah, Games Workshop, will actually do it eventually. That'd be great. Adam, does it still remain a universe without a miniature game that you would like to see come to life? Adam, does it still remain a universe or genre without? I don't. Sorry, I guess I don't get the question. Um, is there still a universe that doesn't have a miniature game that I would like to see? Uh, okay, maybe that's, that's, I think, what you're asking. So is there a type of genre out there that they don't make a game for yet that I would be interested in? Um, I can't think of anything, frankly. Uh, I mean, you've got, you know, post-apocalyptic. I've, I've got that I like. 
uh, sci-fi kind of stuff. I dig that. Fantasy for Age of Sigmar, generally. Um, also, Frostgrave. Um, Weird World War II is, uh, you know, your Conflict 47. Um, if you're looking for Weird World War I, then um, Gaddis Games has got a game that they're working on right now called Shattered Crown. That's going to be coming out soon. Um, the upside to having weird historical games is that you would probably mix like the weird units in with regular units so like a company can just make the strange stuff but then they're like well then you can just go buy a normal like world war ii guys and you mix them in with these other guys who happen to have laser guns or whatever you know so that's kind of a, 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 an economic thing at least for a company that's smaller and starting out um i don't know that's a good question actually there's a game coming out from osprey sometime this year um, called Dracula's America, which is basically World War... No, it's not World War. I'm sorry, it's just after the Civil War, so it's kind of Wild West era, but there's also vampires and, and werewolves and cults and stuff like that, and so, yeah, I can't think of a, a real genre right now that I really think that someone should make a game for. So, sorry. Uh, what else have we got here? Let's see here. Michael Strange, I guess I just answered the build and play what you think looks cool call. Yeah, that's I think that's the way to go, definitely. Hmm. Let's see here. Namir the Blind, maybe something like Deus Ex or something cyberpunkish. Yeah, I can't think of a great cyberpunk miniatures game. That's a good point. Well, I mean, I mean technically, uh, 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 Infinity is pretty cyberpunky. You know, I mean, there's hackers in that and lots of crazy sci-fi guns. So I think really, yeah, Infinity probably scratches that itch, frankly, yeah. Uh, Frankie Lee Bailey says, Lincoln is a vampire. Um, I think what happened, it's, they are, I think Frankie Lee Bailey, or sorry, frankly, uh, Lincoln in, in the, in the uh, Dracula, Dracula's America, it is, actually Lincoln gets killed by Dracula and Dracula's minions or whatever. And then Dracula becomes president for life of America after they dominate the uh, Senate. So that's kind of the differences there, right? Let's see here. Jake Potter says, so I would love to play Malifaux, but no one plays said game, so I play what everybody else plays. That, that kind of happens in this hobby, frankly, uh, because you, you know, you one thing you can do that I've talked about before, especially with a skirmish game like that, is you build two forces because they're small, and then you um, you go and you get uh, you start teaching people how to play Malifaux at your local shop, and maybe you're going to convert people. You know what I mean? So definitely. Um, the new painter says, "I want to see a kaiju giant monster game. The only one I've seen is Monster Apocalypse, which was pretty meh. It was a uh, it was um, what do you call it? It was." Uh, like collectible, you know, like you got you bought a box and there was a bunch of stuff in there you didn't know what you were going to get. So yeah, that was kind of one of the downsides of Monster Apocalypse. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I would love to see a Shadowrun skirmish game made. Yeah, I could see something like that. They did make, years ago, WizKids made, I think it was WizKids, made a Shadowrun game, but the miniatures were huge. They were like... I don't know, like four or five inches tall, and then, but they were almost like an action figure. They were attached to a base. It was a big, thick, round base, and the base had a little drawer you could pull out to keep their different weapons in. So you could swap out this gun with this gun and that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, that didn't sell very well at all. They were super cool looking, but nobody wanted to play that game. It seemed so. Uh, yeah, that was back before WizKids went out of business and then got bought by somebody else and then came back. And this was probably, again, like in the 2000s. They were sort of cool-looking models. I mean, they were all, you know, pre-painted and stuff because it was WizKids. And they didn't... They weren't as bad as normal hero clicks, So that helped, too. But definitely. Let's see here. What else have we got? Hey, Jay Tick. How you doing? Greetings, Adam and the other minions. Good to see Jay. Jay and I are going to be going to Gen Con uh, coming up soon, as will uh, Matt and I as well. So, yeah, we'll be having a good time uh, in the uh, middle of August. That'll be a good time. <clears throat> Let's see here. Sasha says, I played D&D minis and Star Wars minis. I wanted to play, not build and paint. Now it's just reversed, and I play those uh, Age of Sigmar and 40K. 
much richer world. Yeah, I played. Um, I didn't play the D and D models or game, but I did uh, buy some of the models and use them for other games like Song of Blades and Heroes because it was just nice to have quick pre-painted you know guys. Especially since I'm teaching it frequently at conventions, that I'm not letting people I don't know touch my painted models. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, here, use these pre-painted plastic ones and get Cheeto leavens all over them. Um, yeah, totally. So, um, but like the, I played the heck out of the Star Wars minis game. That was made by Wiz, not Wiz Kids, Wizards of the Coast in the mid 2000s. And it was pretty cool. Uh, it was, I mean, it was a skirmish game. There were pre-paints, not great pre-paints, but a little better than um, I think the ones from, from Wiz Kids. And uh, yeah, we used to play like every week at the comic shop. This was back before we had two game shops in town, so we always played at the comic shop. And that's where he sold them, so we bought them from there and everything like that. But yeah, it was a good time, definitely. Thomas Wakefield asks, Adam, do you have an opinion on Weird's upcoming war game or war, war scale game, The Other Side? I saw some of the models for The Other Side at ACD Game Day back in May. So they're making a, a larger scale game. So it's not a skirmishy game, it's designed to be a little bit more battle scale. Uh, the thing that's interesting is that instead of like a lot of battle scale games where you move guys around on these rectangular bases, their game is on round bases. So you might have like three or four guys or one big guy, and all the round bases seem to be the same size. And so it's interesting. Um, the models look really cool. I didn't get a chance to like demo it or anything like that, so I don't know much about it other than what I've just mentioned. But it's going to be within the world of Malifaux. Um, I don't know. To me, it doesn't seem like Malifaux is a world with big battles. Malifaux seems like a much more skirmishy type world. You know, like... To me, at least, that's the way it seems. But uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, some of the models, like I said, I posted some pictures back late March, or sorry, late May. Um, posted some pictures on social media of some of the models, like on Instagram and things like that. I did, and they are pretty cool. There was a bunch of a bunch of fishmen actually that I posted. Actually, they were were cool models. One of them was super tall. So yeah, I don't know when that's coming out. Later this year, I think. Definitely. Daniel asks. Hey, Adam, do you think GW will eventually phase out the old Space Marine miniatures? I don't know, particularly. There's there's a part of me that thinks that the Primaris Space Marines are designed so that you can yourself choose. Do you want to just use them as regular Space Marines in your army? Or, because if they just would have said, hey, look, here's the new Space Marines. They're bigger and taller. They're true scale now. Knock yourself out people would have freaked out because then people would have been like so i gotta change all my space marines and now you're 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 killing me over here and then games workshop would have said well you don't have to we're just saying you can if you want to and then but people wouldn't have listened to that there would have been a lot of freaking out and gnashing of teeth uh so i think what they did was they're like look here's new models here's new rules for the models if you want to play them as another tier of space marine between say terminators and and regular space marines you can if you just want to buy these models and say that they're regular Space Marines because you like how tall they are in comparison, like they should be, um, you can do that too. Whether they'll phase out the normal Space Marines, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe. Maybe eventually they will, but I don't... I get the feeling that they... Uh, I don't know. I doubt it, but maybe they will. I think they just want to leave it up to you and say, look, you want to run the taller guys? Cool. Because the thing is, is that really the complaint's always been... Why are Space Marines the same height as Imperial Guardsmen? Like, Space Marines in the fluff are supposed to be seven feet tall before they even put on their armor. So if you put them next to an Imperial Guardsman in the game, they're about the same height. So they decided finally, I think, to make True Scale Marines, but they didn't just want to say, hey, these are True Scale Marines and you should upgrade because people would freak out, like they did with when they started putting 32 millimeter bases in the in the games. People were like, now i got to rebase everything? And they're like, you don't have to. You know, we're just, we've are just we just made this change, and if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. But people didn't listen. They just immediately, you know, went crazy. So we'll see how that works out. Warcryer asks, Adam, did you ever play Confrontation? I never did. Um, there were two versions of Confrontation. There was the original version where there was metal models that you had to paint and all that jazz. And a lot of people, well, not a lot. Not a lot to keep the company in business, but many people really liked the game. Specifically, a lot of people, especially painters that I know, really liked the models. They were some of the best models ever, according to a lot of the painters that I've talked to. Then, 
uh, Rackham, the French company that made that game, then decided to make a pre-paint game. So it was pre-painted models within the, uh, uh, the confrontation universe. Um, but uh, but they weren't like random like they are with like you know uh, hero clicks that you could see the guys in the box. You bought a box of this, you know, it was like a squad of these guys, and then everybody was the same. And they were not bad paints, you know, for being pre paints. They were pretty good. They made, at the same time they also made a game called AT Forty Three, which was a, a sci fi game. Um, same kind of thing, though pre paints, you know. And uh, as a French company, they just couldn't keep it together. I don't know if that, I mean, it's not because they're French, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying the French company that did that could not keep it together. They started working with Fantasy Flight to be distributors in America for that stuff, which I thought would have helped. But pre-painted models are really tough to keep the production up on. You know what I mean? Um, Star Wars miniatures, or Star Wars X-Wing miniatures... Uh, it's had that same problem early on. There were times when you're like, oh, I want to buy some TIE Fighters. And then every store was like, sorry, nobody has TIE Fighters because they're all sold out. They've gotten, obviously, now for the most part to the point where they're relatively better with that. But it still takes, I mean, they can crank through those minis pretty quickly in the factory, but it still takes some hand work to get them done. And so they can't just, like, let a machine do it and just turn it on and then go to lunch. It's, it still takes a good amount of work. Which is why the production is not necessarily as fast as it sometimes could be, but you know they've just decided to throw more people at it because now they can because they're the best-selling miniatures game the last couple of quarters. Uh, X-wing is. So uh, all that being said, a smaller company who decides to do that, uh, it makes sense why it kind of eventually, sadly, crashed and burned. I know that those those metal models, the original metal models, still go for a decent amount of money on um, eBay. And I heard that they're going to try to restart the line to some degree, so maybe some of those models will start coming back so people can get into it. But I never got a chance to play the actual game, so I don't know anything about the rules specifically or how it was handled that way. But I know a lot of people were into it. So <clears throat> Sensational models from Rackham. Yes, exactly. That's always what I heard about the, those. And I've seen some of them. Like I know Sam has got a small collection of them that he's purchased from places he's found, like stores that didn't know what they, you know, that... Didn't know what they had and had them on clearance and stuff like that. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, this just in. Adam thinks the French can't run companies. That's obviously not true. Uh, but, yeah. Um, what else have we got here? Try finding a Y-Wing in the UK. See, I've heard that there have been some production problems again just because... I think it's just because the game is selling so crazy well. There was a time where there was entire parts of that line that you couldn't find. It's been mostly in stock, at least at my local shops lately, so that's been good. But I know he has said that there have been some production problems here and there, so there's that. Uh, do you ever consider launching a campaign for your Patreon, for example, and cover it in your channel? That would be great. Um, a campaign, like a like a gaming campaign. I haven't really thought about doing anything like that. I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I've thought about doing a lot of different things that are gaming related uh, on the channel. As far as like, I kicked around the idea for a little while, and it's still on the back burner of kind of making my own kind of limited kind of game and producing it as a free PDF and then kind of seeing where that goes but I'm no game designer so I, I haven't I've shelved that idea for now sadly Matt knows what I'm talking about I talked with him a little bit about it um, but yeah I haven't really thought about doing like a campaign or anything like that that's kind of an interesting concept but um, yeah I don't know not really Audrey says the Rackham models were so beautiful Vince Ventrola uh, did a good wargaming history vid about the fall of Rackham yeah he was a big, from what I understand, he was a big fan of their stuff too. Um, because again, he's, you know, he's, Vince is a very good painter. If you've watched uh, his, uh, well, he doesn't really talk about paint too much on Warhammer Weekly. That's a show he does on Wednesdays with a couple other guys, Tom, and the, usually a guest. I've been a guest on the show a couple of times. Um, but yeah, he was in the, if you watch the video that I did from Adepticon where I talked to all the different um, painters, he was one of them. He's got kind of a mustache, kind of goatee thing and glasses. And, um, He's uh, he's a good painter, and and, I, and that that Rackham stuff seems to be right up his alley from the stuff that I've seen him paint. He posts he posts things in the um, tabletop minions showcase paint showcase club too. So 
uh, Daniil asks, Hey, Adam, what is your opinion on X-Wing and the other sp- uh, space-based Star Wars game? Um, I think that it's probably the greatest gateway game that we as tabletop wargamers have ever had available. So um, what I mean by that is I have seen people, my, myself specifically, who started playing X-Wing and then eventually moved to like Age of Sigmar and paint like they started playing X-Wing because they liked it and they, then all of a sudden they started painting some of their X-Wing ships and then they've now moved into like regular wargaming. I think it's brought more people into wargaming. Um, admittedly, some of them are not going to switch over. At my local shop, there are probably three or four different Magic players who all of a sudden got into X-Wing because they didn't have to paint it and they didn't have to glue it all together and all that stuff. They'll probably never flip over, but there's always the chance that maybe one of them will or whatever, you know. And so it's it's been it's brought a lot of people kind of into the hobby or at least became, made them more aware of it, you know. If you've never really played a war game before and you start playing X-Wing, but you're at this table and the next table over, there's somebody playing like Malifaux or Conflict 47 or Mercs or 40K or Age of Sigma or whatever, you'd be like, oh, those are really cool. Those are really good paint jobs. And you're like, oh, yeah, I had to do that. They didn't come that way. Oh, you know, really? You had to paint? Yeah. And just, you know, that kind of stuff. Just the awareness, I think, really helps. Um, I don't think it drives people away from the industry, frankly. I think it, I think it, it just, if anything, I, mean, I called it out as a gateway game on my channel two, three years ago. I think it's a good idea. Let's see here. What else have we got? DJ Piper says, rip templates. Yes, the, the templates are gone now in 8th edition. Um, there are no more templates. I made a sh- small little YouTube video about what you can do, or not YouTube, sorry, Facebook video, about what you can do with your um, 40K templates now that there's no more templates in the game. Uh, Drink Coaster is several of the choices, as it turns out. But uh, yeah, so I think it's a good idea. That is, um, I think, I, I don't know, I think that... There were so many arguments, you know what I mean? There are so many times when you're just like, well, I think you can get four guys here. No, I think you only get three. Well, I'm pretty sure if you move it, well, that's, you know. And now they've just kind of mitigated all that by saying, this weapon does D6 hit or whatever, you know. And then you're like, okay, well, that's there you go. There's your, there's your answer. Um, yeah, so there's that. I know this is unrelated to 8th edition, but do you play any role-playing games? And if so, would you consider doing videos on them? Um, I haven't played a role-playing game in a long, long time. My first foray into any type of gaming that was not Sorry or Monopoly or things like that, in fifth grade, I started playing D&D with uh, a couple of guys that I knew like in school, and then um, I had a babysitter, and he, uh, he, was a, he was maybe only like four years older than I was, but it, he would, he was a, his mom and my mom were, good, were really good friends. So when he would come over, um, we would uh, he would show me how to like play you know D and D. We would work on uh, making castles on uh, graph paper and doing stuff like that, figuring out what our keeps were gonna look like you know once we had enough gold pieces and jazz like that. So that's when I first got into anything kind of gaming related as we like to refer to it now. Um, I played Shadowrun just after college quite a bit. Uh, I lived with two other guys, and a, a third guy would come over on Sunday nights, and he would uh, game master, and we would play on Sunday nights for a couple of years. We played Shadowrun, and then probably about six years ago, seven years ago, um, we played Dungeons and Dragons 3.5. I'm getting a nod from my wife. Yes, so my wife and I and several other couples and, and stuff would, would play some D&D, but otherwise I haven't played any um, role-playing games in a long time. It's not, I don't know. It, like, lately, if, if, if I don't get to paint stuff in it, I'm not as interested. I mean, technically I could paint models for Dungeons & Dragons, obviously, you know, because everyone's got to have a little character, and there's probably a bunch of orcs or kobolds or whatever. Um, but yeah, I just I haven't gotten into it as much, and I've heard that fifth edition, the newest edition of eighth of uh, the newest edition of D anD D, is the best edition ever from like people who've been playing since the old days, and are been playing all along and going through all the different editions. I ask them like, so what do you think of the new fifth edition? And I've got I've got one friend who I respect his uh, opinion quite a bit on uh, on D anD D because he's been playing it since the beginning, and he's like, yeah, this is the best edition they've ever done. So that's really good because a lot of people didn't like fourth edition, as it turns out. So, you know, good on Wizards of the Coast uh, making a, a right turn or whatever and, and deciding to uh, to change things up and people really enjoying it. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I would 
do videos about it on this channel. If I got back into it real heavily, which I don't particularly foresee, I would probably start a second channel. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I don't know, but probably not going to happen because, I, like I said, I haven't played a, a I haven't played a, a regular RPG of any kind in quite some time. So, Adam, you've mentioned BattleTech over the years and have said that you thought the models could be a bit bigger and better looking. Have you? checked out Cav Strike Ops from Talon Games Reaper. I remember Cav, when Gen Con used to still be in Milwaukee, uh, there was always like a big Cav um, booth, and I always used to see all... It was a lot of hover tanks and some robots. I used to see the artwork and stuff like that, and yeah, they were, they were, they were pretty heavy into Reaper. I don't know anybody that plays it around here at all. To be fair, I don't know a ton of people who play Battletech. I know a couple, maybe, but I don't know anybody that plays Cav. If they're trying to like relaunch it again, I should look into it. But I don't, I, I don't know anything about the, the, the that cab stuff really. Dalton asks, "Is that bullet bourbon?" Yes, right back. Right, yeah. There's two bottles actually there. Um, long story why there's two half drunk bottles of bullet, but the, yeah, it's. I think I actually mentioned it a couple of videos ago. So yeah. Um, Devin says, I've played every edition of D&D, and 5th is far and away the easiest to GM. Oh, that's pretty good. Lucius says, Adam, what would you consider to be worse experience for any new painter? Not thinning your paints enough or thinning them too much? What would it be the worst experience? Um, not, not, thinning your paints, not thinning your paints enough is worse. Because when you put... Like, if you thin them too much and you put them on there, it's just not going to have much of an effect. And then you'd have to put on more layers, so it might take you more time. It's an additive process versus a subtractive process. If you put on too thick of a paint, now you've got paint that's much too thick on there. You know what I mean? So now it's very difficult to get it off without stripping it. So um, always thin your paints more versus less. You know what I mean? Um, if you have to make a decision, if you're not sure, mm, I don't know, add maybe a little bit more water and see how it goes. And if it's if you're putting it on there and it's just not really doing anything, then you can know, all right, now add a little bit of paint back into there. And this, I'm assuming you're doing this on a palette, specifically a wet palette, is if your best if you know your best bet. Um, but then go from there, and you should be better off for that. Uh, it should work out pretty well, definitely. Pierre says I've played since Chainmail. That's old school D and D. Old school. I like Fifth best, but prefer Pathfinder. Pathfinder has also gotten a huge. They got a huge boost when Fourth came around because a lot of people left D and D altogether and went to Pathfinder. And Paizo's really been smart about how they've handled it. So Pathfinder's also like a big. You know, there's there's two camps there, and I'm sure there are people that are playing both. But um, generally, you're kind of playing one or the other. I mean, it's difficult. I mean. I know people who play in multiple campaigns, so I could see like maybe on Tuesday nights you're playing Pathfinder with these guys, and on Sunday night you're playing you know D and D with these guys. That's fine, but to switch back and forth in groups, you don't see a lot of groups that do that too frequently. There are some groups I know that I've had some friends who used to hop around between systems all the time, but um, generally it's more often than not you're gonna stick with one system just because you know it and it's easier for you to understand. Let's see here. What else have we got? Thinning paints too much is a nightmare. Well, I mean, it can be, but it's, uh, like I said, I still think it's it's better than the opposite, which is having chunky paint on there that makes your model look chunky and, like, obscures the detail and stuff like that. So, yeah, thin coats, I think, is, is, is better. <sighs> Sasha asks, Adam, some people seem to find it hard to swallow the fact that you kill off models from wherever in the units you want and not really those front lines. How do you care? Um, so that was the old way to do it back in the day. Um, like when I first started playing, I want to say in 5th, you pretty much, if I remember correctly, you just peeled off the guys you wanted to peel off. What we're talking about here is, let's say you have a unit of 10 people, 10 soldiers. Maybe they're Space Marines, maybe they're uh, Dire Avengers. I just, I think that's an actual Eldar. Uh, unit. Anyway, so you take some incoming damage and you have to kill off several figures out of that unit of 10. So it used to be, when I first started, I, as the person owning the guys, I so I have been shot at, I got to peel off the guys that I wanted to. So you probably didn't pull out the guy who had the really cool gun because you're like, well, I don't want to do that because then I won't have the really cool gun. So you took out some extra guys who were maybe normal. And you went from there. When 6th edition came around, 
they decided to change it up. And now you were supposed to take away the guys who were closest to where the fire was coming from. So if you've got a group of guys that's in an area roughly this big and the gunfire is coming from here, then the guys on this side who are closest to the gunfire have to die first. So then it became a game of trying to figure out, all right, well, I need to put my commander or my, my, my sergeants in the back. I need to put my flamer guys in the back. But the thing is, you put your flamer guys in the back, then when you flame, you're going to set your own guys on fire, which is very problematic and weird. And now here in 8th edition, they've decided to go back to the old way where you just take off the guys you take off. You know what I mean? It makes the game slightly more abstract, but I think I think it makes it better, frankly, to just be like, well, you know, it's it's a little more abstract, but you have to understand that this is this game is not a simulation it's a game you know what i mean if you wanted to get heavy hardcore into simulation i would probably tell you that you might be wanting to go look at video games a little bit more because then we're talking about actual line of sight hit boxes all that kind of stuff that's easily trackable by the computer when we're playing a tabletop game we have to understand like to complain about the fact that well you should really be killing the guys in the front because of this i'm like yeah but Honestly, that bolter can only go 24 inches. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? So if you start talking about scale and all that kind of stuff, then you have to go. You should go all out if you're going to go that way. My personal opinion. You may think differently. And honestly, there's no reason if you and your friends want to play 8th where you peel off the guys who are in the front, you knock yourself out. You can. But the rules tell you to do it the other way. You don't have to follow the rules. That's one of the great things about tabletop games is that as long as you and your opponent agree, you don't have to follow the rules anyway, you know? If you and your opponent want to play a different set of rules when you're playing um, a, a video game, you kind of can't. You have to figure out a way to mod the game if you want to, you know, so that you can make it so that instead now this gun only shoots this far or only does this or this rule has changed. It's difficult, obviously, to do. Much easier to do on tabletop, so. What else have we got? Someone Special says, that's their actual name, I don't, I'm not making any judgment call there. Someone Special says, Adam, have you considered visiting Mini Wargaming? I have. Um, I'm thinking about it. Uh, what I would probably do, most likely, is one of two things. I, I would most likely fly. I looked at how long it would take to drive there, and it would take like 13 hours, and I hate driving. So I probably wouldn't do that. I don't know. Like, if my wife and I decided we also wanted to vacation in Buffalo, New York, then maybe we would make a trip. My wife is giving me a thumbs up on that. I don't know why. I mean, but what's in Buffalo? Anyway. Um, so, but yeah, they're close to, they're like just across the border from Buffalo, uh, uh, New York. So most likely I would end up flying to Buffalo and then renting a car and driving half hour, 45 minutes, and then I'd be in Welland. Um, which is where they're based. So I've, I've been kicking around the idea. I will see Dave and crew at Valhalla in October, so maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it then, and maybe I'll go there next year. But um, I'm thinking about it, definitely. I'm, I mean, I'm, thinking about, I'm also thinking about maybe going to PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia. My wife and I are talking about that as well because we've got some family there we could go visit real quick, which is kind of a two-for-one, so that's nice. PAX Unplugged, PAX is the Penny Arcade Expo, which is generally mostly about video games, but they've decided to start making tabletop gaming conventions as well. And the first one's coming up in November in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. So might go to that. Uh, might be, again, another twofer because I might be able to go for that, not just for, for the channel, but also for work, for the app that we're working on because it's going to be aimed towards tabletop gamers and be a good place to show it off and talk to people and stuff like that. So we'll see how that goes, but that could be coming up. Uh, what else have we got here? As a 26-year-old, what game shall I get into as a noob? What's popular? Uh, well, if you want to look at sales, most popular is X-Wing, Star Wars X-Wing. Um, if you've never played any of these games before, Star Wars X-Wing is not a bad place to start because you don't have to paint the models, you don't have to build the models, you just take them out of the package, kind of put the little ship on the little base, and then you've got cards and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a big competitive scene for it if you're into that. If you're not, you can play some of the scenarios that come in there or just have fun at your local shop playing regular pickup games with people. Um, it's not bad. If you're interested in more of the modeling aspect, painting and the, the building and all that kind of stuff, then the most popular game is the current second most popular, um, as far as sales are concerned, game in uh, um, 
in that in, in the category of tabletop wargaming, and that would be Warhammer 40,000, which is kind of what we're talking about right now, to some degree, on and off, and because yesterday was the launch of the newest edition of, of Warhammer 40K. So, you know, if you're into that, if you want to build and paint and that kind of stuff, um, and you want to find, if you're looking for popularity, people to play with and stuff like that, you're probably better off to going that direction. Now, that being said, there are certain games, and I've been noticing this more and more, there are certain games that are popular in certain areas of the country or the world that are not popular in other parts. Like right now in the middle of Wisconsin, roughly, where I live, there's not a lot of um, War Machine players. But if you start to go south of here into the Milwaukee area, down in the southern part of the state, there's a lot more War Machine players. So maybe you're into War Machine, so that would be a good place. But it, the thing I would tell you is if you had to make it, if you had to decide with no research, like in your local area, I'd tell you probably X-Wing or, or 40K, depending on whether you want to paint and build or not. Um, if you go to your local shop, if there's a local shop nearby, then you could say, well, what does everybody play here? If you're looking for people just to you know pick up games and find people and make new friends and that kind of stuff, go to your local shops and find out what gets played there and then make your decisions based off of that. So that's my best um, advice on that right now. What else have we got in here? Um, Ratmaster says, For your information, in case you missed it, Adam, I used Citadel spray can black primer on some Bones minis, and they seemed to work. We'll try airbrush primer and straight base, uh, straight base coat and see what works best. I've not run into the problem, but I've heard from some people that the Bones, um, so Reaper Bones, they're these white plastic... Uh, minis that mostly fantasy, but not all, and, and they're kind of a softer plastic, but they're super cheap. They're like three bucks a model or four bucks a model or something like that. Um, some people have had a trouble had trouble getting them to be primed properly because the primer would always be tacky. It's something to do with the type of plastic that they do. I don't know. Uh, so, but he's saying that the Citadel stuff worked, um, and. He's going to try airbrush primer next. So that's interesting. I, I Like I said, I didn't have the trouble, but I think the primer that I used on the few Bones guys that I've used, the primer was the Krylon camo stuff, which has got the fusion technology in it, which is supposed to stick to plastic better. So maybe that's just why I didn't have any trouble. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a... It's, it's interesting to find out. Like I've There are other people out there. I know that there's a YouTube channel called Dr. Faust's Painting Clin Clinic. Dr. Faust's painting clinic, I think. I can picture the logo in my head, but that's about it. Um, he does a lot of Reaper Bones paint uh, tutorials, so he's probably got some better information on what the best primer is for that material in, in comparison to me. Like I said, I've only painted a couple. Like Some of my Frostgrave guys are bones, modified bones. Um, some of my post-apocalyptic guys that I've built and, and just kitbashed have, are also, they've got bones bodies, but I've kind of swapped out their arms and stuff like that. One of the bonuses to the bones is that they're really easy to cut and, and, and modify if you want to. So yeah. <clears throat> Adam, do you have any friends that are super competitive in tabletop wargaming, like a pro player? Um, I know some guys who are super into it, and, and like I've got a couple of friends who kind of don't have an off switch on that, and, and not like in a bad way necessarily. I'd like my friend Kevin, he... Like he'll be like, okay, well, we'll get together and we'll just play like a real, you know, we'll just we'll just play like a real fluffy kind of fun game. I'm like, okay, cool. And then he will bring a list. And this was more sixth edition. Uh, I haven't played again. I've only played against him a couple of times in seventh edition, um, and I haven't played against him at all in eighth edition yet. But at the time, he'd be like, I'll just bring a super fluffy list, and it would just be, in my opinion, a pretty bone crusher of a list. So I'd just be like, <sighs> he's like, well, no, seriously, like you know. But he plays. He used to play in a ton of tournaments, and he's just you know. Some people, they just don't, they're not able, they, they only always ever see the best strategy, whereas I never see the best strategy, so uh, that's, I think, maybe the difference there. But I don't, um, yeah, it doesn't cause, I mean, I don't have problems with it. There are people I have played against who aren't necessarily friends, but acquaintances who are super competitive, and then I only play them generally once, and then go, okay, well, thank you, you know, and then I don't really play against them anymore because I'm not into the super competitive, you know, min-max lists, so that's not necessarily fun to just get kicked around the table non-stop the entire time, so I just play with people that I like to have fun with instead. But that's my way I handle it, so definitely. Travis says, I had that same problem with Reaper Bones, but that stopped after I started washing them in the sink. That's interesting. 
I guess I hadn't heard about that. I, I mean, I could see being some sort of mold release that would be making it so the paint doesn't stick. I just washed some uh, resin terrain yesterday in the sink to get the mold release off. Mold release, for those of you guys that don't know, is this powder, usually, that gets sprinkled inside of the mold and then the plastic or whatever, the resin, goes in there and it helps it so that when you want to take the resin piece after it's dried out of the mold, it will release, it will come out easier. Whereas if you don't sprinkle that stuff, it's kind of like making eggs in a pan. If you don't spray something in there or whatever, then you, the eggs will stick. It's the same type of deal. When you're making, a, a, you're pouring stuff into a mold, if there's not some sort of mold release agent in between the mold and the actual stuff, the stuff is much more likely to stick. And with a, with especially with resin, because the molds are rubber, if it sticks, when you pull it out, you might rip off part of the mold, and now your mold is all screwed up. So um, you usually with resin, you need to try to just really quickly kind of scrub it off with like an old toothbrush, and a, you know, like throw it in a little bit of Tupperware, just a drop of like dish soap, kind of scrub it off with a toothbrush, and then take it and throw it into, uh, um, you know, let it dry on a piece of paper towel or something like that. And, uh, and that'll help the paint stick to it a lot better. So, Cyber Nicola says, I have bought $300 of minis, yet I still haven't played a match. Well, you know, maybe you're just much more into the um, modeling aspect. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, maybe you want to... Because there's a lot of people that don't want to play with unpainted miniatures. So there's people that will just put them together and then you know, play with them as they're kind of going through and painting them. There are people who will put them together and pretty much never paint them. They mean to. Sometimes they complain about, man, I wish I had the time, but I did a video about that a couple of weeks ago, so you can watch that. Uh, and then there's other people who are like, I just am not going to play with a model until it's painted. So then sometimes it takes them a long time to get their stuff painted. But as long as they're having fun, you know, sitting in their craft room or their hobby room or their basement or whatever, painting, listening to audiobooks or podcasts or watching TV while they do it, that, that's, that's, that's a big portion of the hobby, you know. If you're only into the gaming, then I would tell you to look into stuff like uh, X-Wing and things like that, because then you don't have to worry about all that stuff. But, yeah. Don't worry about you're not playing enough. Unless you really, really want to play more, then you got to look into it. But if you're, you know, what's best for you is what's best for you, which sounds dumb, but is kind of true. I think that rhymed. That was weird. Um, what else have we got over here? Blues Light says, I've given my Reaper Bones a good wash and then hit them with the Krylon Camo Black Primer and it works like a charm. That Krylon Camo stuff is awesome. I just love it so much. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the few bones that I've painted, I have actually used Krylon Camo paints on them and they've worked great. So um, I think that's part of the deal there. Audrey says, the nice thing about Frostgrave is that the randomness of the system makes even non-optimized lists fun to play because your garbage thief might actually get lucky uh, against a scary wizard. That's very true. Um, you know, there's there's something to be said about that too in a lot of uh, role-playing games. You know, I mean, uh, years ago, back in college, actually, I forgot about this one. One of the game I did play in college was uh, it was called Rollmaster. It was made by Iron Crown Enterprises. Some people frequently called it Chartmaster, but it was based in the. We were playing it based in the. Um, Middle Earth, you know, Lord of the Rings kind of realm, and uh, I had this wizard, wizard uh, elf wizard who was also good at archery because it was, you know, it was Lord of the Rings. Anyway, and um, I killed just because of an amazingly good roll. I killed a pretty major character in the campaign that the GM had made up, and we had to. He had to sort of scramble to change the story because I totally killed that guy like with one really good shot. Um, Rollmaster was designed that way. You could roll, it was all percentile dice. So you rolled, and if you rolled between a 96 and a 100, you got to roll again, which is frequently known as exploding dice um, in, in a lot of different types of games. Some games, if you roll a 6, you get to roll again and then add it. In this, if you roll a 96 to 100, you got to roll again and add it. And if you rolled another 96, you got to go, it just kept going and going and going. And I just rolled just absolutely crazy. And uh, the result was, according to the chart, that was one of the reasons they call it chart master, is you had these critical charts that gave you tiny little descriptions of exactly what happened, and there was a different chart for every different type of weapon. So the arrow chart had one 
that said. Basically, long story short, is I fired and the arrow went into his eye and the back of his head blew out. I don't even know how that would happen. I don't think it would, but that's what the description was. So that guy totally died. And then uh, our GM was like, okay. And then he kind of had to come up with all new stuff on the fly because that guy was going to be in the campaign for quite some time. Things like that, that randomness, I do find interesting because I'm not a tournament player. Exactly. That's exactly the case. Billy Joe, 1305, says, Speaking of paint problems, I bought some used Tau, and one of the drones has a moving gun that folds inside. I have no idea how to paint. Usually I just paint before assembly, but I don't have a choice. It's difficult sometimes. Like, I almost always completely assemble my models and then paint them, but, like, I don't... If I'm building a Space Marine, I do not bother to keep the bolter off, because the bolter is hiding the crest or whatever those guys have got on their chests but frankly I don't care because like I'm, I don't need to paint that because it's just it's a troop it's just another space marine I don't need to keep that gun off I'll just be like okay his armor's blue and there's some you know etching in there but I'm not going to mess around with it that's fine um, but when I painted my Warriors of Chaos they have a huge honking shield which covers a lot of their body and it was very simple for me to keep that off during the painting process and then glue it on as the last step and that worked out quite well, but I don't generally do sub-assemblies myself. Um, I did a video about sub-assemblies, so you could find out about the tricks that I used, but with that towel with the folding gun, I'm not quite sure how you would do that either. That's a good question. I would, if there's a specific name to that type of drone, maybe just do some YouTube searches, and you'll probably find somebody who's like, here's a tutorial on how I did this, and maybe that'll help. Um, but that's the best advice I've got for that, sorry. Uh, Dalton says, we used to call it Rollmaster, R-O-L-L, -L, instead of R-O-L-E, because of all the rolling. I got an adult dragon as a loyal pet, but I pulled a lever and it crushed both our heads. That totally sounds like stuff that would happen in Rollmaster. There's a lot of, of, a lot of sort of weird shenanigans in that game, but it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Melody Dawn says, exploding dice is not always a good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, if it's an exploding die on a 1 through 6, in my mind, that's not great. You know what I mean? Like, because you've got a 1 in 6 chance to really do well, like on nearly any roll. But with the mechanic for Roll Master, because it was percentile, it only happened if you rolled 96% or higher, which means on 2d10, two, two you rolled a, you know, the first one was the 10s and the second one was the 1s. If you rolled a 96, 97, 98, 99, or 100, then you got to do it again. But so frequently you didn't do that. So in my mind, that it worked out really well for that. And it made crits really actually critical. Um, yeah. Uh, Jay Thomas says, oh yeah, it's a, over here, cello, this is a cello case. This is my wife's cello case. It's not just like a weird one-eyed robot looking over my shoulder. Although we could put eyes on it, maybe. We put some googly eyes on your uh, cello case? I'm getting a stink face from my wife. So no, no, no no googly eyes on the cello case. It'd be hysterical, because we could put him above the thing and then make it look like he's got an open mouth and he's yelling. <laughs> I'll think about it. We'll, we're, we're, she'll think about it. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, what else have we got here? Adam, I bought the Vallejo Surface Primer to use with my airbrush. I assume I just thin it like normal airbrush paints. Um, I don't. Well, let me take that back. For the black primer, I don't. When I'm using the black primer for Vallejo, I don't thin it at all because it's designed for airbrush. I just pour it directly into my airbrush and go to town. For the white, I do frequently thin it a little bit. And the reason is because, and, and I could be wrong on this, I'm no airbrush scientist, but the pigments in the white are probably bigger than the pigments in the black. If I don't thin my white, I notice a lot more um, dry out on the tip of my airbrush, meaning that you get like built up paint on the very tip of the needle, and then eventually it starts not spraying as well, and then you have to look at it and kind of, what I then generally do is I generally kind of just blast it a little bit like onto a piece of paper next to me, not onto my model because that would suck. Just blast it super full blast, and that will clear it, and then I can get a little bit more control back again. But I find that the white has a tendency to dry the tip more so I do thin my white a little bit. Um, but more often than not, when I'm actually using the white primer, I'm using so little of it because I usually do everything in black. But when I want to do the 
underpainting technique, uh, zenithal highlighting as they like to call it frequently, I will do the entire model in black and then just dust from above with white and then I don't usually dry out too much. It still do, you know, if I have like a lot of models I'm doing all at once, then yes, but otherwise I generally don't too much. So it works out pretty well. Um, but yeah, I would thin the white, I, at least with Vallejo, I, I would thin the white because I've had more trouble with it than I with the black. The black I take straight out of the bottle and it's always worked fine for me. So yeah, definitely. What else have we got? For priming Reaper Bones, check out this good article from the Reaper Forums. Okay, cool. But yeah, I would, I mean, honestly, the Reaper Forums is where I would expect some articles about how to prime those models because of the plastic. That totally makes sense. Uh, let's see here. What else have we got? Hey, Adam, your Get Started video was great, but any tips helping when it come? it seems like life keeps sabotaging your hobby time? Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that if you have you know, a lot of family uh, stuff going on with kids. Uh, let's say if you've got a bunch of kids, that's just going to make it difficult for you to hobby. But the fact of the matter is it's also going to make it difficult you, for you to do lawn work. It's going to make it difficult. I mean, kids can take up an amazing amount of time, uh, obviously, from what I've been told. We don't have kids. We have cats, which are nowhere near the same. They're way shorter, first of all. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean... It, it's difficult, but if you've got the free time, you know, the kids are in bed or whatever, and you've done the laundry and all the other things, you know, then you have to make a choice there. And one choice is, do I just sit and watch TV because I'm tired? Sometimes that's the case. Or do I sit and paint? Even though maybe I'm tired, but it's going to help kind of give me like a, um, almost like a meditative sort of relaxation if I'm still doing something with my hands. That depends on the person. That depends on everybody. Um... I find the motivation is actually getting things done. I find the motivation is I'm, I now have these models and they're painted that I can take them to the shop and people can be like, oh, I like that, you know, or whatever. For me, that's a big motivator. So, um, and also just, again, it's kind of the relaxation, kind of meditative sort of thing. I'm, I'm listening to a podcast or I'm listening to an audio book and I'm painting and, and just it's nice to just sort of focus on a specific thing um, while I'm doing that and that's cool. But it depends, you know. I mean, some people just... The, the trick is I've had a couple of people in the comments who have said, well, you're just being an elitist by saying that everything has to be painted and you have to do all this stuff. And I don't feel that's the case. I'm saying if you, because some of those people are saying, well, I just want to put the models together and never paint them and just play. Okay. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. And if your opponents are cool with it, that's also fine. That's great. My main concern in that video, kind of part of that rant, is the people who say, oh man, I really want my stuff all painted but then they never actually do it. If the people, if there are people out there who put them together and have no interest in painting them and they don't ever want to do that, that's their choice. But they're not complaining about it. They're not going, oh man, I wish I had, you know, I wish, it, I, wish I did this, I wish I did this. You know, you can wish a lot, but actually doing is a different story. And again, like I said, if you've got plenty of other things, if you work 12 hours a day, if you've got lots of kids or even a couple of kids or even one kid, whatever, you've got other things that are in the way, that's fine. But when it comes down to times when you do get free time, and then you don't spend it on this, then you have to ask yourself, do you actually want to get this stuff painted or not? That's that's kind of the trick. Um, and again, I didn't want to be heavy-handed with that video and, and kind of go on about that stuff. I just wanted to sort of say, you know, if anything, if anything, saying that you're just not in the mood and you just want to veg on the couch because you've been working a long time and taking care of your kids and all that stuff, that's fine. But then don't, when you're at the shop, complain about how you don't, you don't have any time to get your stuff painted. You made a choice, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the complaining, I guess, just in general. Complaining in a lot of situations does nobody any good. So either deciding I will paint when I'm in the mood and have the free time, and maybe it's only once a month, and I'm okay with that, great. Come to terms with it. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But the other option is you know, to just do it when you want to. There's times when you don't want to paint, but you're still like, well, I mean, maybe you don't have the motivation. I'm not saying you don't want to paint. There are times when you just don't have the motivation, but you sit, at least I sit down and start, and then it seems to just sort of go and snowball. Uh, so yeah, everybody's a little different, but that's, I guess, <laughs> to some degree, the best advice that I've got on that right now. And Meldroth has a good point. Table ready does not equal pro painted. Absolutely. I... I've had several people in comments recently, and it's mostly the comments, that video I did a long time ago about rattle can techniques. I've had some people in those comments 
talk about those two cultists that I painted, and they're like, well, they're not very good paint jobs. They kind of suck. And I'm like, well, A, photographs, and this is an interesting thing that I'm going to make a video about soon. Photographs, A, will find more uh, faults in your paint job than you can somehow see. And I don't know why that is. I don't know how many times I've looked at a model and going, yep, that's great. And I take a picture of it and go, I didn't notice. I forgot to paint that hilt or whatever. And it's something about like your brain just skips over it. But when you look at it in a photo, it, you can't look away. I don't know how that works. But I've actually started now thinking that I'm done with a model and then I photograph it even just with a cell phone, with my cell phone and like some okay lighting. And then all of a sudden going, oh wait, I totally goofed that part up. So I've started using that as a technique once in a while, especially not so much on regular troops, but like on HQ units and things like that. I've been using it as a backup, basically like a second opinion, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I don't know. But that, that kind of stuff, normal tabletop painting, those cultists were not meant to be winning me awards. They were meant to be painted cultists. And when you have a lot of one figure, cranking them out pretty quick and not to necessarily super crazy high quality, that's up to you. If you need every single one of your last footman, troops, general puds in your army to be the best possible model that you can do, that's great. Do that. Understand it will take you years and years and years and years to get you anything finished. If you say, I have a lot of skeletons that go in my Age of Sigmar army and I need to find a quick and easy way to paint skeletons, then do that. And they will still turn out, I think, relatively okay. I don't know. I like the skeletons that I've done so far. I did a video about how to do skeletons quickly. Worked out great. Um, and yeah, they were basically, I'm just looking for shortcuts and ways to cut down. I just think it, it makes sense, especially with stuff you're just doing for tabletop. If you're trying to win a crystal brush, you need to spend hundreds of hours on a model easily. And you've probably needed to spend hundreds of hours on previous models for years and years and years and years to really get to that level. Those guys are not playing with those models, you know what I mean? So if you're making it ready for the tabletop, don't worry that it's not as cool as all the pictures that you see in the magazines or on the front of the, you know, the box from Games Workshop or whatever, or anybody. Mal well, Malifo doesn't usually put painted models in the front. They usually put pieces of artwork. And in the back, they have those computer renders, which are kind of cool, I think, actually. But nonetheless, um, yeah, just when you're doing stuff for tabletop, speed is, the speed is in my opinion, speed is the, the main motivator. Let me see here. Luke Snell says, it's not being elitist wanting to play with only painted models. It's all about the immersive experience of the unique experience that is tabletop gaming. I agree, generally. Um, I prefer to play with all painted stuff, but other people don't. Um, and sometimes, you know, maybe you don't have to play with those people if you don't want to. Or maybe you just say, okay, well, my stuff at least is painted or whatever. Or maybe, like, I'm going to be playing a game on Thursday. I'll tell you that some of that stuff's probably not going to be painted because... I haven't played eighth. I haven't played 40k in a long time, so a bunch of the stuff will be. But I know that some of the stuff won't be. If I bring my Hell Drake, it's not painted. Um, it's built. So, um, but my plan is is that if I like using him in the army, then I'm going to try to you know I'm definitely put him in the painting queue and make him go into there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I, there are some people who will absolutely never play with an unpainted model. I am not that guy. I wouldn't ever go to a tournament with unpainted models, but again, I don't really go to a lot of tournaments, so that's not that big of a deal. But when I went to Adepticon this year, I brought along Age of Sigmar uh, models to play with. As it turns out, I did not bring all of them, which I didn't find out until later. But uh, So if Mitch is watching this, sorry that we didn't play. Uh, that was a time issue, but if we would have played, I wouldn't have even had all my models anyway, so that would have been a problem. Uh, anyway, but everything that I did bring and everything I thought I brought, they were all painted. So. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just me, though, because that's, for me, the painting is a bigger portion of the hobby than the playing, so. Someone just asked if I've heard of All Quiet on the Martian Front. Yes. Someone, I think, in the video yesterday that was for the patrons uh, was asking about an alternate history, or no, not an alternate history World War uh, One. They were asking about, was something about, um, or maybe it was a comment I was answering. I know someone was talking about... Uh, H.G. Wells, and they're like, oh, it'd be really cool if someone made a, you know, War of the Worlds game. And I'm like, well, actually, they have. So there's a game called All Quiet on the Martian Front, which is a game basically of War of the Worlds. So you've got the big tripod walkers and the troops and then a bunch of roughly kind of World War One ish kind of uh, fighters against them. 
and it was a small indie game that started out for a while, and then some other company bought it, like like a retailer, like maybe the War Store or somebody miniature market I don't remember one of those companies like bought the rights to it and started producing stuff for it so it's probably maybe a little bit easier to find I know I saw some tables of it set up at Adepticon this year and the models looked really cool so if you're interested in that kind of stuff that might be something that you would want to look into um, I don't know I can't like I said I don't remember who bought it and what's going on with it but I know it's just called All Quiet on the Martian Front and it's basically kind of War of the Worlds the the, 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 the game so uh, definitely Mr. Mixie when does the stream end well you know, soon, as it turns out. About another six minutes. Uh, I usually run from 9 in the morning my time until 11 in the morning, and then I have to go to lunch. So, um, good or, good afternoon from sunny Malta. Well, hello. I don't know if I've ever had anyone from Malta before. That's fun. The new painter says, Woo, finished my second Intercessor Squad. Only 20 or 4 more Primaris left. Uh, yeah, that's well, that's good, though. I've seen, I've been seeing a lot of people on the uh, Facebook group on the um, Tabletop Minions Paint Showcase Club. I've seen a lot of already painted models since the you know the stuff came out yesterday. People have been like, oh hey, here's all the these guys I've been working on. Here's this guy, and I'm like, wow, that's crazy how quick some people are getting through that. But that's really cool. I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear it. So yeah, Cyber Nicola says, for me, I have painted all the minis I've bought so far to the best of my ability, which was bad for the first two hundred dollars worth of minis. I think I just really enjoy the painting aspect and looking at minis. There's Games Workshop has said, and I need to look it up again, but they have done some surveys before to try to find out how many people actually just buy the minis and then never play. They just buy them because they want to paint them and collect them and, and that kind of stuff. And it's a surprising number. It's easily over 50% of their sales from what I remember seeing. I remember seeing this and going, wow, and now I can't find the article. But um, yeah, it's a lot of their sales. It's a seriously non-insignificant number of their sales is people who just buy the stuff because they want to play it. Or, sorry, because they want to paint it and collect it and stuff like that. Put it in a case or whatever. And they don't play the game generally. So, you know, that's... And, and sometimes it's people who, like, have the intention to play the game and then just never quite get there because they're always working on their army and always trying to add more and add more and they just never quite get to that point. But there's other people who have absolutely no intention of buying the game. They buy some of the books just to get the idea of color schemes and things like that, but they don't really ever deal with the rules much because they just want to, you know, be in that kind of world and paint that stuff and everything. And that's really cool. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Let's see here. Is All Quiet based on books or movie? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if that All Quiet on the Martian Front is based off of the book War of the Worlds or if it's based off of any of the movies. I'm going to say probably more book, more likely, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, what else have we got? Josh McCarthy says... Uh, oh, he's talking to Ratmasters. It's a different thing. Um, it's its own setting, like 20 years after the book. They do have their own books, though. Well, that's cool. Okay, yeah, so that's talking about, again, uh, All Quiet. I think I had heard that, that All Quiet was, like, after the book, so, um, like, the Martians had come back. Something along those lines. That's kind of cool. Let's see here. Narlf. That's a fun word to say. I used to play with unpainted models in the past just because I wanted to experience the game. Today there will be only one unpainted unit at max. Today I paint and only after and only after you're done painting build the next one. Well, that's that's a good that's a good plan to have. There's a lot of people who, you know, I have talked to people before who don't like they 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 work on one project at a time or they will say I've got everything I own painted and then I will buy new models and then paint those models because they don't want unpainted models around. Um, it's difficult. There's a lot of discipline involved in that, obviously. But um, yeah, that's 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 kind of an interesting way to go. Cypress said, "I just sprayed up my first squad of Primaris Marines. Something wrong as the spray can died on dried on the models like powder. Not happy, so stripping models will redo them with my airbrush." Um, sometimes, if primer is old, it will get real super powdery. Um, that's sometimes an issue. If like it, you may have just bought it, but it might have been sitting on a shelf at the store for a long time. That sometimes happens. Sometimes it's how far away you spray from. Um, humidity is also a factor. More often than not, honestly, like 
too much humidity and it takes a long time to dry, sometimes too little humidity, and if you spray it from far away, the particles of paint are actually starting to dry before they hit the model, so then you get that real dusty stuff, and especially then sometimes even you can just brush it off, which is not great, obviously, if that's not, not the effect you're looking for. So yeah, um, I generally use airbrush most of the time. When it's nice out, especially if I'm doing terrain, I do generally find I like to use um, the you know a, a rattle can sometimes, especially terrains. Just it can just be quicker. Um, I would tell you if you if it's available in your country, depending on where you're at, take a look at. Um, I honestly like I really like the Krylon. So it's Krylon makes a line of paints. It's only six colors and it's camouflage paints and they're super ultra flat and they also stick to plastic like crazy because it's got this stuff in it called fusion technology and um, it comes in black dark brown two shades of like kind of khaki sand and two shades of like olive drab like a lighter and a darker and a lighter and a darker for both of those and that's all the colors they make um, but if you like we're gonna you know prime your stuff black anyway then the black is good if you were gonna do a warm color like Honestly, if you were going to paint your guys to be, let's say, Blood Angels, who are a warm color, red, you could prime the brown and then paint the red over the top, and then you would just get, like, real warm brown sort of in the shadows, like, underneath the arms and between legs and stuff like that. Any places that your red spray did not get in, you would get this nice warm shadow, and that could be kind of cool. I don't know. There's a lot of different options. If the primer is powdery, you were too far away from your model, six inches away max. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's... um. Like I said, sometimes it's, uh, you know, the paint is old. That also happens, too. So, yeah. Brush-on primer is your friend. Sometimes. Depends on the primer. Depends on the model, too. Because if there's a lot of detail, sometimes you can add a little bit too much primer and fill in the detail. Yeah. Uh, Krylon. There's C-R... Or, sorry, K-R-Y-L-O-N. It's only just the one O at the end there, not the one in the middle. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, by the way, hi from Scotland. Hello, Rob. Good to hear. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. It's actually a minute after. So um, I appreciate you guys coming and checking out the stream and, uh, and, and the chats today. That's been cool. So, um, yeah, we'll see you again in two weeks. There will be another video on f this upcoming Friday. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what it's about yet, but um, I've got an idea. So we're, we'll be doing that. And um, just kind of doing some other stuff. I'm going to start posting... Like, as soon as I get the new date for TMX, for the Tabletop Minions Expo, I'll post that on that website so that people can start planning if they're interested, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much about it. For those of you who are fathers, happy Father's Day, if you do that kind of thing in your country. Many countries seem to, which is cool. And um, uh, pretty much that's about it. So I hope that you guys uh, have a good day, and uh, we'll see you back here again in two weeks. And thanks for watching. <laughs>